Guys, I'm Luca. Uh, so this is my master class. I'm going to go through a bit of my life coming into music and just a bunch of random stuff that I've picked up over the years. I've been doing this professionally about a little over five years now, but I got into it five years before that. Anyway, let's, let's start. And there's me like a few years ago at Escape. <laughs> they gave me the little thing. It's great. All right. There's me as a scene kid. That's when, <laughs> that's when I got into music. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, it was a fun time. I was really into screamo and punk and mallcore and MySpace and LimeWire and all that great stuff. Uh, thank God you don't have to deal with that now. If LimeWire was terrible. You'd download a song and you thought it was Linkin Park and it was like some obscure porn. And you're like, oh God, I'm eight. What is this? Um, anyway, so... Fast forward a bit, I went to college. I couldn't be in the scene bands anymore. I was doing drums, I was doing screaming, stuff like that, but uh, there wasn't enough room, so uh, I torrented FL Studio because uh, I couldn't afford it. And I'm not recommending you do that. Nope, don't sue me, Image Line. I'm just telling you the truth, what happened. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we have purchased it since, do not worry. Um, anyway, so uh, I was terrible when I started, absolute trash for the longest time. Uh, but it was so fun. And uh, so I didn't actually go to school for music. And that's where the, the next bullet point, right? Self-directed uh, self versus schooling. I don't think you have to go to school for this stuff, but it definitely helps. I definitely wish I did. So, um, you know, there are a lot more options now than when I started for getting into, you know, electronic production. You have schools like Icon here who do a fantastic job. But if you're on a budget or you just you know, have terrible ADD like me, self-directed is a totally valid option for going about teaching yourself. So there are so many resources out there, even more now than when I started. Um, I know when I was getting started, there was a YouTube channel called Ace Finkter, like, <laughs> but it was spelled like Ace Pinkter. And he just went through every single parameter that you could possibly go through on FL Studio. He showed you twisting every knob, like what everything did. It was kind of just a crash course. And there's a lot of good channels like that now. Um, I assume, how many of y'all are on FL? And how many of y'all, uh, show, show of hands for FL. We got one, yes, FL gang. And how, two? All right, and how many of y'all are on Ableton? That's what I'm thinking, yeah. Ableton is probably the superior product, I'm not gonna lie to you. But, uh, you know, it's the thing is once you learn something, you know it and you work your way around it fast, it really doesn't matter which program you're on. But for the ease of collaborating and, uh, you know, Ableton just supports their products so well. Yeah, you guys are on the right track. Don't switch to FL. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, but yeah, they're like even now, like Mr. Bill, like I still will Google stuff to if I'm having trouble deconstructing a synth that I want to learn or something like that. There's so much stuff out there, but you got to comb through. Uh, can I curse? Yeah, that's a yes. You got to comb through the bullshit. There's a lot of that. That wasn't that bad, but. Uh, a lot of that out there, there'll be these guys that are taking 30 minutes to go through something that, you know, you could explain in like a minute. So, you know, hit the two times on those. But for the other things where it's like a great tutorial like Mr. Bill or things like that, I strongly recommend doing like active learning, which would be open your DAW up at the same time. Don't watch a tutorial while you're making breakfast or you're on the train or something like that. You want to actively be doing like modifying the parameters in your synth or doing the same things that the, the tutorial giver is doing so that you understand the process and you can internalize this because the goal is like to never actually have to go to those things, right? You just hear a sound and you're like, oh, I remember making a synth this other time with, with the same sort of timbre and then you go through that same process like unconsciously. It becomes part of your creative process and it doesn't, you just want to minimize the amount of time where you're like, oh, how do I do this? Or where is this sample? Or this, all this crap, you don't need that. You want to go straight in, like from the moment you have the inspiration to putting that music into your DAW and creating it. So anything you can do to cut down on that time, I think is phenomenal. Anyway, internet forums. Reddit's great. I see Raymond here. What's up, man? <laughs> I'm, so I'm sorry. We got Plurigati boy, though, here. Fantastic, man. Yeah. <laughs> from the Reddit trap sub forum. Uh, there are a lot of great resources on Reddit. And I remember also like dubstep forum, dogs on acid. Uh, who's that one guy? He had a forum, doesn't matter. You can find so many like sample packs and 
tutorials, and it's just a great community to be a part of. I strongly recommend that you involve yourself in those things. Like even now, I still lurk and comment occasionally because you can find some gems out there or just new ways of thinking about producing music, and it's a it's a great resource. So don't sleep on that. Um, here's the most important thing, though for getting good quick, and that's reverse engineering songs to the best of your ability. It doesn't matter if you do it perfectly. But so say you really, really fuck with the Skrillex song that came out, and you're like, how do I even go about doing that? Well, there's a very simple step-by-step -step process you can go about to, to learn what he did, and that would start with the drums, with the arrangement. So you take whatever track that you're trying to do and, and come as close to, and then you just start with the kick drums, place all the kick drums on the track on a new channel, right? It doesn't have to be the same kick drum. You're just trying to get a feel for it. Then you put in the snares, other percussion elements, and then you start with the basic melodic elements, so the bass line or uh, the sub. Uh, for some styles of music, the sub's so low or has no harmonics, we're thinking rhythm, you know, where it's just atonal in, in the mid-range. But for that, there's a cool trick where you can just pitch the whole track up uh, either uh, 12 semitones, like an octave, or two octaves, and now the sub is going to be at a higher uh, frequency range, and you'll be able to hear it easier and figure out what the baseline is, essentially, or the sub. Um, that's a great trick I use all the time. Uh, Y2K taught me that. Shouts out to him. Uh, and yeah, anyway, then you go through you know the top line itself, the melodic arrangement, and then the chords last. Unless you're you know classically trained, if you have music theory training, I'm sure that's going to be a breeze to you. But the whole point of this is that you do this. I still do it now. You do this for as many songs as you possibly can across every range of style, anything you're interested in, because you want to learn how they're doing it, and it becomes an unconscious part of your process. So you don't have to go and say, like, oh, how am I going to get myself out of this eight-bar loop? That was always my problem when I was just starting, is I would have these cool ideas and not be able to progress beyond eight bars, beyond 16 bars. If you know in the back of your mind what a proper arrangement is for the style that you're trying to do, you just keep going. And then you end up with more tracks. And the more tracks you have, the better you get. It's dope. That's, that's what you want to do. Anyway, it's, it worked for me. I'm just telling you guys what worked. Anyway, let's go to the next thing. Let's link and build, fam. We all live in LA. You know, you fucking heard that before. Um, let's go through these pictures, though. Uh, this is uh, on the top left. That's Josh Pan. That's Crane. That's me before the blue hair. This must have been like five years ago. And then down one, that's me and Akali. And then up, that's uh, Oshi in the middle, Sober Rob. We lived in a big trap house, basically a SoundCloud producers, and it was a great time, a uh, very fun, creative household. And then down here is one trap house before that. And there's Fleming Gosis, uh, Josh Pan in the back, Young Bay, uh, me, Blackford, Blackford, Y2K. Uh, yeah, anyway, you want to build a community of friends, of other artists that they don't have to be in your same you know, neck of the woods, genre-wise or musically speaking. But it really helps to have a community of people that can support you and that drive you forward. So, you know, I see a lot of people, you know, start little group chats on Twitter and stuff. I had a group chat on Facebook with all these guys. And, you know, it's fun. You go through the, uh, the EDM drama with everybody. And, but besides that, it's, it's a great support network. And you can go in for feedback. You can collaborate with these people. And you come up together. And that's a really, I think, underrated point that a lot of people skip over. You know, there's no I in team, but like the dance music is a very tight-knit community. And it's important to make sure that you have a squad that you can count on. And like, you know, there's going to be a lot of shit that, that gets thrown at you throughout the years in this crazy industry. So it really helps to have friends that are in the same boat as you that you can, you can come to for that kind of stuff. Um, also, just collaborating in real life. That's so important. And it's so fun. And you'll learn so much. There's like things that I would have never thought to do. I think a great example is like, uh, I was, uh, you guys know Quicks, right? I have like, I have a few tracks with it, but only one made it out. <laughs> but like, there was something so simple where uh, there's this preset on a FL's uh, parametric EQ that you pop up and it's literally just like a low pass, high pass filter. And I was always using a different method that was way more convoluted. And I was just like, oh, this is like the superior way to do this. It's faster. And so you'll like see stuff like that when you're working with other people in real life and it'll really help your workflow out. So I strongly recommend that. Even if the track doesn't come out, you know, it's just a good practice. And you know, there's a lot of ways to make music or make money in music. And one of those is producing for other artists. So if you get comfortable being in the studio with other people and actualizing their ideas, 
it's a good way to make money. And you know, if you can make money and do what you love, that's really the goal, right? So uh, sending your music to blogs. <sighs> yeah, fuck blogs, man. I'm so glad that that era is over. But there's still gatekeepers, you know? You still got you know, this random guy who doesn't really have much to do with music that is controlling whether you get placed in a Spotify playlist and whether people hear your music or not. Um, my solution to that is really just cultivate relationships with people that you like, that you enjoy, that share your same musical taste. Don't, you can still send cold emails around, like I still do occasionally, but you know, you're not really seeing much of a return on investment in that. It's much better, you know, the same thing with your community of artists, basically, this all ties together. You want to, you know, become friends with that A&R that, at that label that you fuck with because he understands your vision and he's not going to, like, dick you around and give you a shitty contract, things like that. If you're just, like, going cold all the time, it's really not going to work out long term. Uh, the same thing goes with, like, passing your music around to other DJs, like dub plates, unreleased stuff things that you really fuck with and you think will work well in a live environment, it really helps just slide in the DMs. You know, be like, hey man, take this, play this out, put it in a mix, whatever. There's so much more value to be had if RL Grime is playing your unreleased track for like two months than if you let it just sit on your hard drive because you don't want anyone else to see it or you're worried somebody's going to steal it. Don't do that. Send it off. It's better that it's out there. And put out music as much as you can. Don't, don't be afraid to do that. You know, like Sometimes you'll look back, I have a very big back catalog and I'm not gonna lie to y'all I'm not proud of all of it <laughs> like there's so much stuff in there but I was proud at the time when I put it out and you gotta you know you just gotta grin bear it you gotta be confident anyway and this brings it to the Kanye method which I don't know if it's really Kanye said it but let's pretend for a minute all right so the feedback part Kanye tons of people in the studio always coming in and out but he asks everybody that's on the track what their opinion is about what he's working on. He might not agree with them. He might not take what they say and actually apply it to the music he's working on. But he uses that as a litmus test to see whether or not his track is popping or what needs to be adjusted. If enough people say something, he's going to be like, okay, this needs you know, some work. And you need to apply that with your own music when you're in the demo stage, sending it around to your close community of friends and be like, yo, you like this? What's wrong? The mix sucks, the kick sucks, something, whatever. If you hear that from a few people, you're like, okay, maybe I can make a few adjustments. But also you want to be confident because sometimes people tell you something, you're like, eh, and you disregard it, and that's fine. But you got to be able to distinguish the two, and it's important to do that. The other part of this methodology is the constant creation. So uh, there was a study a while back where they had an art class, right? And they had two groups of students. And one group of students was said, hey, you can make one art piece every day for 30 days. It was like a pottery class. And then we will grade you on your last piece out of those 30. And then the other group of, of kids, they were like, we just want one piece from you. So you can take all 30 days and do one piece. The people in the previous group who made 30 separate pieces of pottery scored way higher than the people who just made one. And the point here is that you want to just make as much as you can and not worry about perfection because you're never going to achieve perfection. But you can get close by making it a habit, by doing your best on every track, by improving your workflow, by being consistent and efficient. That's what makes those crazy hits that's going to make you blow up. Not being like, oh, I'm going to spend a year on this one thing. And then what happens if that thing flops? Like, you're going to feel like shit. But if you have 30 opportunities to feel like shit, you're going to feel way better. Don't worry about it. All right, on to the next thing. Getting your career off the ground. This is me uh, prepping a set last minute because my hard drive died, <laughs> which is going to happen. Life's going to throw you some curveballs, a lot. But you do your best. Anyway, how did I do, you know, how did I get to where I'm at? I did a ton of bootleg remixes on SoundCloud. I was dodging copyright infringement left and right. It was amazing. I don't know how I did it. And I don't know if you could do it now, but I still think doing remixes is a great way to get off the ground and to get yourself heard. It also associates you with like a certain artist. So say if you like, you like Skrillex, you like Dead Mouse, you like Io, you like Jaws, whoever. You do a bootleg remix of it now, still, now people are like, oh, I didn't know that artist before, but I like Jaws and I kind of like this too. Maybe I'm gonna check out what he's doing after that or what she's doing after that. Or, you know, if you have other pronouns, you know, we're all, we're all welcoming here. Um, but uh, yeah, that's still a very good way to go about getting your stuff out there. But at a certain point, you do want to pivot to originals. You want to have a vision lined up for your own music, for your own trajectory. And I'm in that pivot right now. But like uh, a great example of somebody who did that was Kygo. Fantastically. 
So yeah, just keep that in mind if you're going to go the remix first route that you want to pivot eventually. Um, ghosting, look, I'm going to tell you right now, if somebody wants to buy a track off you, you're good enough to make music and make money off it yourself. So you should be getting in the studio and getting splits, percentage points on things. You shouldn't be giving away signing all your rights to a track away. Somebody's going to be like, oh, no, how could he say that? I'm sorry to whoever lost money off that. But yeah, that's what you should do. Do that. Um, you can also, you know, there, you can do odd jobs in music that are still related to your to your goal, which I assume is to to make this your living. So, you know, you could get an internship at a label. You could get, you know, start working at a blog, a music curation site, things of that nature, which aren't like so far away from your final goal and still help you learn more about the industry. Um, you can teach lessons too at a certain point. I did that for a bit when I was like struggling to pay rent. I would do uh, Skype lessons, and I was like still like honestly somewhat of an amateur, and you know, that helped me pay my rent. So you just got to think a little outside the box, but this is a creative field, you know, flex. Uh, content creation, but not just music. Yeah, you want to start branching off a bit too. Like, uh, I think everyone has, uh, you guys know Nitty Gritty? Yeah, he's doing great right now on TikTok. Yeah, so he's just branching out. He's like, how can I still be making music but get more people to, it's free advertising, basically. I tell jokes on Twitter all the time. I troll like Zed all the time. Like, you got to do stuff like that, but only if it's, like, in your nature, right? Like, don't push yourself to be, like, ex-DJ just because you see them doing that. Like, if you like cooking, then try to figure out a way to incorporate cooking into stuff. If you like, like, I love comedy, and that's why I do that. Um, so, yeah, just find what works for you. And this goes into our next point about creating your brand and your persona. Here's the most important thing is be fucking honest with yourself. Don't be disingenuous because people will see right through that. You know, if you're trying to be somebody that has already existed, people are going to see that and be like, well, why do I want the B-tier Dylan Francis when I can just go look at Dylan Francis? So think about that. But it's good, you know, creatively to draw from a wide array of people. So if you are a little bit of Dylan Francis and a little bit of, you know, I'm just using so many artist names, but you know what I'm saying. A little bit of a bunch of things creates something new. That's what you should be thinking about. And building a team, this I could go way more into depth about, but I really think that you should be hustling on your own and not hustling to find like somebody who's going to make your career because a lot of people are vultures, man. And like, they're not looking at it like that. They're like, what can I get out of you? And you got to be the person who has the most to offer on the table so you can dictate the terms. So if you already have everything is popping and things are going well and you're getting show offers and you're getting you know, labels are hitting you up like, hey, can we get, we like that last track, can we get another track from you? Then you're also going to probably see in your email inbox like people being like, hey, do you have management? Do you have an agent? Is somebody representing you? Then you go into those things. But don't start off looking for those things because it, it doesn't put you in a good position. And you really want people to come and are like drawn to what you're doing so that they're passionate, just as passionate about you, or just as passionate, <sighs> just as passionate about your project as you are. 